Poems from the Inner Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doten. A Word to the World. In presenting this volume to the public, I trust that I may be allowed, without incurring the charge of egotism, to say somewhat concerning my spiritual experience and the manner in which these poems were originated i am in a measure under the necessity of doing this lest some over anxious friend or would-be critic should undertake the work for me and thereby place me either unconsciously or intentionally in a false position before the public by the advice of those invisible intelligences whose presence and power i freely acknowledge seconded by my own judgment i have given to this work the title of poems from the inner life for aside from the external phenomena of modern spiritualism which compared to the great principles underlying them are but mere froth and foam on the ocean of truth i have realized that in the mysterious depths of the inner life all souls can hold communion with those invisible beings who are our companions both in time and eternity my vision has been dim and indistinct my hearing confused by the jarring discords of earthly existence and my utterances of a wisdom higher than my own impeded by my selfish conceits and vain imaginings yet notwithstanding all this the solemn convictions of my spiritual surroundings and the mutual ties of interest still existing between souls whether in the body or out of the body have been indelibly impressed upon me from such experiences i have learned in a sense hitherto unknown that the kingdom of heaven is within me i know that many sincere and earnest souls will decide at once in the integrity of their well-trained intellects that this claim to an intercourse with the invisible world is an extravagant assumption and has no foundation in truth to such i would say i shall make no effort to persuade your reason and judgment i only offer to you as a suggestion that which has been realized by me in my spiritual experience and has become to me an abiding truth full of strength for the present and hope for the future when your souls sincerely hunger after such a revelation you will seek it and according to your need you will be filled therewith until then you and i regarding things from a different point of view must inevitably understand them differently there are various cups which humanity must drink of and baptisms which it must be baptized with and this manifestation of truth of which i am but one of the humble representatives has laid its controlling hand upon me for what purpose in the mysterious results which lie concealed in the future i cannot tell i only know that it is so looking back upon my experience i cannot doubt that i with many others was destined to this phase of development and designed for this peculiar work before i knew conscious being my brain was fashioned and my nervous system finely strung so that i should inevitably catch the thrill of the innumerable voices resounding through the universe and translate their messages into human language as coherently and clearly as my imperfections would allow the early influences of my childhood the experiences of later years and more than all that unutterable yearning for beauty and harmony which i felt dimly conscious was somewhere in the universe all tended to drive me back from the world which would not and could not give me what i asked to the revelations of my inner life to the heaven within me it was only through the cultivation of my spiritual nature that spiritual things were to be discerned and the stern necessity of my life was the teacher which finally educated me into the perception of truth i turn back to the memories of my childhood to that long course of trying experiences through which i passed guided by strange and invisible influences and that whole course of discipline has for me now a peculiar significance those who were near and dear to me and who were most familiar with my habits of life knew little of my intense spiritual experience I was too much afraid of being ridiculed and misunderstood to dare give any expression to the strange and indefinable emotions within me. 
such ones however may call to mind the child who often through the long winter evenings sat in profound silence by the fireside with her head and face enveloped in her apron to exclude as far as possible all external sight and sound what i heard and saw then but dimly returns to me but even then the revelations from the heaven within had commenced and succeeding years have so strengthened and confirmed my vision that such scenes have become to me living truths and blessed realities the heaven that lay about me in my infancy sent its rich glow through my childhood and sheds its mystic brightness upon the pathway of my riper years often in the retirement of a small closet i spent hours in total darkness lying prostrate on the floor beating the waves of the mysterious infinite that rolled in a stormy flood over me and with prayers and tears beseeching deliverance from my blindness and seeming unbelief then when by my earnestness the spirit had become stronger than the flesh i would gradually fall into a deep trance from which i would arise strengthened and consoled by the assurance from whence i could not tell that somewhere in the future i should find all the life and light and freedom that my soul desired the only evidence or knowledge which those around me received of such visitations was occasionally a poem some of them written so early in life that the childish chorography rendered them almost illegible because of these early productions it has been asserted that my claim to any individual spirit influence was either a falsehood or delusion i will only say in reply that there is no need of entering upon any argument on the subject i claim both a general and particular inspiration they do not by any means conflict and what i do not receive from one comes from the other for the very reason that i have natural poetic tendencies i attract influences of a kindred nature and when i desire it or they will to do so they cast their characteristic inspirations upon me and i give them utterance according to my ability it is often as difficult to decide what is the action of one's own intellect and what is spirit influence as it is in our ordinary associations to determine what is original with ourselves and what we have received from circumstances or contact with the mind of others yet nevertheless there are cases where the distinction is so evident that it is not to be doubted only one or two such well-attested instances is sufficient to establish the theory i am not willing to ignore one faculty or power of my being for the sake of proving a favourite idea and on the contrary i cannot conscientiously deny that in the mysteries of my inner life i have been acted upon decidedly and directly by disembodied intelligences and this sometimes by an inspiration characteristic of the individual or by a psychological influence similar to that whereby mind acts upon mind in the body under such influences i have not necessarily lost my individuality or become wholly unconscious i was for the time being like a harp in the hands of superior powers and just in proportion as my entire nature was attuned to thrill responsive to their touch did i give voice and expression to their unwritten music they furnished the inspiration but it was of necessity modified by the nature and character of the instrument upon which they played for the most skilful musician cannot change the tone of a harp to the sound of a trumpet though he may give a characteristic expression of himself through either the presence and influence of these powers is to me no new or recent occurrence although i may not have understood them in the same light as i do at present they have formed a part of all my past life and i can trace the evidence of spiritual assistance running like a golden thread through all my intellectual efforts as i do not desire to practise any deception upon the public but on the contrary only wish to declare the simple truth i have published in this volume quite a number of poems written several years previous to my appearance before the public as a medium or a speaker although these were mostly wrought out of my brain by the slow process of thought yet for some of these even i can claim as direct and special an inspiration as for those delivered upon the platform the first poem in this present work the prayer of the sorrowing and that which immediately succeeds it the song of truth containing in itself 
an answer to the prayer, were given to me under peculiar circumstances. The first was the language of my own soul, intensified by an occasion of great mental anguish. The second, following directly upon it, was an illumination of my entire being, when I seemed to have wept away the scales from my eyes, and, by the deep conflict of my soul in prayer, to have broken the fetters of my mortality, and stepped forth into that freedom whereby I stood face to face with the ministering spirits, and heard that song of truth sounding through the universe. I have only known but few such visitations in my lifetime, but when they have come, I have felt that I have taken a free, deep breath of celestial air, and caught a glimpse of the realities of things. As an immediate consequence, my spirit has become braver and stronger, and long after my inward vision was closed, the cheering light of that blessed revelation has lingered in my heart. Another poem which bore evidence to me of an inspiration acting upon me, and external to myself, was The Song of the North, relating to the fate of Sir John Franklin and his men. I was desired to write an illustration for a plate, about to appear in The Lily of the Valley, an annual published by J. M. Usher of Cornhill, Boston. I endeavoured to do so, but day after day passed by, and my labour was in vain, for not one acceptable idea would suggest itself. The publisher sent for the article, but it was not in being. One day, however, I was seized with an indefinable uneasiness. I wandered up and down through the house and garden, till finally the idea of what I was to do became clearly defined. Then, with my paper and pencil, I hastened to a quiet corner in the attic, where nearly all my poems had been written, and there I wrote the Song of the North, so rapidly that it was scarce legible, and I was obliged to copy it at once, lest I should lose the connection. The next day it seemed as foreign and strange to me as it would to any one who had never seen it. At the time this was written, in April 1853, strong hopes were entertained of the discovery of franklin and his men together with their safe return therefore i hesitated to make public that which seemed a decided affirmation to the contrary nevertheless so strong were my convictions as to the truth of the poem that i allowed it to be published later revelations concerning the fate of that brave adventurer and his companions gave to the poem somewhat of the character of a prophecy how far I have ever written, independent of these higher influences, I cannot say. I only know that all the poems under my own name have come from the deep places of my inner life, and in that self-same sacred retreat, which I have entered either by the intense concentration of all my intellectual powers, or a passive surrender to the inspirations that moved upon me. I have held conscious communion with disembodied spirits. At such times it has been said I was entranced, and although that term does not exactly express my idea, perhaps it is the best which can yet be found in our language. The avenues of external sense, if not entirely closed, were at least disused, in order that the spiritual perceptions might be quickened to the required degree, and also that the world of causes, of which earth and its experiences are but the passing effects, might be disclosed to my vision certain it is that a physical change took place affecting both my breathing and circulation and my clairvoyant powers were so strengthened that i could dimly perceive external objects from the frontal portion of my brain even with my eyes closed and bandaged also in that state any excess of light was far more painful than under ordinary conditions in the communications given through my instrumentality have been weak erroneous and imperfect it is no fault of my spirit teachers but arises rather from my own inability to understand or clearly express what was communicated to me in relation to the poems given under direct spirit influence i would say that there has been a mistake existing in many minds concerning them which i take the present opportunity as far as possible to correct they were not like lightning flashes coming unheralded and vanishing without leaving a trace behind. Several days before they were given, I would receive intimations of them. Oftentimes, and particularly under the influence of Poe, I would awake in the night from a deep slumber, and detached fragments of those poems would be floating through my mind, 
though in a few moments after they would vanish like a dream. I have sometimes awakened myself by repeating them aloud. I have been informed also by these influences that all the poems are as complete and finished in spirit life as they are in this, and the only reason why they cannot be repeated again and again is because of the difficulty of bringing a human organism always into the same state of exaltation, a state in which mediums readily receive inspiration and render the poems with the least interference of their own intellect. Among these spiritual poems will be found two purporting to come from Shakespeare. This influence seemed to overwhelm and crush me. I was afraid and shrank from it. Only those two poems were given, and then the attempt was not repeated. I do not think that the poems in themselves come up to the productions of his mastermind. They are only intimations of what might have been, if he had had a stronger and more effectual instrument upon which to pour his inspirations. I have no doubt that time will yet furnish one upon whom his mantle will fall, but I can only say that his power was mightier than I could bear. As I have regarded him spiritually, he seems to be a majestic intellect, but one that overawes rather than attracts me, and my conclusion has been that while in the flesh, although he was of himself a mighty mind, yet still he spake wiser than he knew, being moved upon by those superior powers who choose men for their mouthpieces and oblige them to speak startling words into the dull ear of the times. As all nature is a manifestation of deity, so all humanity is a manifestation of mind, differing, however, in degrees of development, and one body serves as an instrument to effect the purposes of many minds. This is illustrated in the pursuits and employments of ordinary life, and has a far deeper significance when taken in connection with the visible world. The influence of Burns was pleasant, easy, and exhilarating, and left me in a cheerful mood. As a spirit, he seemed to be genial and kindly, with a clear perception and earnest love of simple truth, and at the same time a good-natured contempt for all shams, mere forms, and solemn mockeries. This was the way in which he impressed me, and I felt much more benefited than burdened by his presence. The first poem delivered by Poe came to me far more unexpectedly than any other, by referring to the introductory remarks copied from the Springfield Republican, it will be seen that the supposition is presented that I, or the one who wrote the poem, must have been very familiar with the writings of Poe. As no one wrote the poem for me, consequently I am the only one who can answer to the supposition, and I can say most conscientiously that previous to that time I had never read, to my knowledge, any of his poems save The Raven, and I had not seen that for several years. Indeed, I may well say in this connection that I have read, comparatively speaking, very little poetry in the course of my life, and have never made the style of any author a study. The influence of Poe was neither pleasant nor easy. I can only describe it as a species of mental intoxication. I was tortured with a feeling of great restlessness and irritability, and strange, incongruous images crowded my brain. Some were bewildering and dazzling as the sun, others dark and repulsive. Under his influence particularly, I suffered the greatest exhaustion of vital energy, so much so that after giving one of his poems, I was usually quite ill for several days. But from his first poem to the last, The Farewell to Earth, was a marked and rapid change. It would seem as though in that higher life, where the opportunities for spiritual development far transcend those of earth, that by his quick and active perceptions he had seized upon the divine idea which was endeavouring to find expression through his life, both in time and eternity, and that from the moment this became apparent with the volcanic energy, with the battle-strokes of a true hero, he had overthrown every obstacle and hewn away through every barrier that impeded the free outgrowth and manifestation of his diviner self. His farewell is not a mere poem of the imagination, it is a record of facts. I can clearly perceive, as his spirit has been revealed to me, that there was a deep significance in his words when he said, quote, I will sunder and forever every tie of human passion that combined my soul to earth, 
every slavish tie that binds me to the things of little worth. End quote. As he last appeared to me, he was full of majesty and strength, self-poised and calm, and it was seen by the expression of his countenance, radiant with victory, that the reward promised to him that overcometh had been made his sure possession. Around his brow, as a spiritual emblem, was an olive wreath, whose leaves glowed like fire. He stood upon the side of a mountain, which was white and glittering, like crystal, and the full tide of inspiration to which he gave utterance could not be comprehended in human speech. That last farewell, as it found expression through my weak lips, was but the faintest possible echo of that most musical and majestic lyric which thrilled the harp-strings of my being. In order to be fully realized and understood, the soul must be transported to that sphere of spiritual perceptions where there is no audible speech or language, and where the voice is not heard. Obedient to the call of the angels, he has gone up higher in the ways of eternal progress, and though, because of this change, he may no longer manifest himself as he was, yet doubtless as he is, he will yet be felt as a presence and a power in the heaven of many a human heart. Upon earth he was a meteor light, flashing with a startling brilliancy across the intellectual firmament, but now he is a star of ever-increasing magnitude, which has at length gravitated to its own place among the celestial spheres. In saying thus much, I cannot so play the coward to my spiritual convictions as to offer the slightest apology for any ideas I may have advanced contrary to popular prejudices or time-honoured opinions. O oh, thoughtful reader, if I have offended thee, say simply that these are my convictions and not yours and do not fear for the result, for in whatsoever I purpose or perform, I can do nothing against the truth, only for it. I do not indulge in the conceit that this little work has any important mission to perform, or that it will cause any commotion in the literary world, but I have felt, as one by one these poems have been wrought out, by general or special inspiration, from my inner life, that in this matter I had a work, simple though it might be, to do and my soul was sorely straitened till it was accomplished as some of these poems appearing at various times have been severely criticised in the past so i would say now that if any there should be who through bigotry or prejudice or a desire to display their superior wisdom should choose to criticise them in their present form to such i shall make no answer but to all those earnest and inquiring souls who feel that in such experiences as I have described, or in the resources from which my soul has drawn its supply, there is aught that is attractive or desirable to them, I would say, God speed you in your search for truth. At the same time, let me assure you that in the depths of your own inner life there is a fountain of inspiration and wisdom, which, if sought aright, will yield you more abundant satisfaction than any simple cup of the living water which I, or any other individual, can place to your lips. There are invisible teachers around you, the hem of whose garment I am unworthy to touch. The words that they speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In order to know more, you must be more. Faith strikes its roots deep in the spirit, and often intuition is a safer guide than reason. When a man, by constant practice, has so quickened his spiritual perceptions, that he can receive conscious impressions from his invisible attendants, he will never be without counsellors. Quote, Let faith be given to the still tones that oft our being waken, they are of heaven. End quote. The spirit world is not so distant as it seems, and the veil of materiality which hides it from our view by hopeful and untiring aspiration can be rent in twain. We only need to listen and attentively and we shall soon learn to keep step in the grand march of life to the music of the upper spheres as a popular author has beautifully said silence is vocal if we listen well with a sublime accord the great anthem of the infinite rolls and resounds through the universe and whosoever will can listen to that harmony till all special and particular discords shall die out from the inner life and the heaven of the celestial intelligences shall blend with the heaven within 
in perfect unison. End of Preface Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doton Poem 1 The Prayer of the Sorrowing and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. God, hear my prayer, thou who hast poured the essence of thy life into this urn, this feeble urn of clay, thou who amid the tempest's gloom and strife art the lone star that guides me on my way, when my crushed heart, by constant striving torn, flies shuddering from its own impurity, and my faint spirit by its sorrows worn turns with a cry of anguish unto thee hear me o god my god o this strange mingling in of life and death of soul and substance let me comprehend the hidden secret of life's fleeting breath my being's destiny its aim and end show me the impetus that urged me forth upon my lone and burning pathway driven the secret force that binds me down to earth while my sad spirit yearns for home and heaven hear me o god my god the ruby life drops from my heart are wrung by the deep conflict of my soul in prayer the words lie burning on my feeble tongue aid me o father let me not despair save lord i perish save me ere i die my rebel spirit mocks at thy control the raging billows rise to drown my cry the floods of anguish overwhelm my soul hear me o god my god peace peace o wilful wayward heart be still for lo the messenger of god is near bow down submissive to the father's will in perfect love that casteth out all fear o pitying spirit from the home above no longer shall my chastened heart rebel Fold me, O oh, fold me in thine arms of love. I know my father doeth all things well. I will not doubt his changeless love again. Amen. My heart repeats, Amen. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doton Poem two, a song of truth, read for LibriVox.org by Abigail Johnston. From the unseen throne of the great unknown, from the soul of all I came, not with the rock of the earthquake's shock, and not with the wasting flame, but silent and deep is my onward sweep through the depths of the boundless sky. I stand sublime through the lapse of time, and where God is, there am I. In the early years, when the youthful spheres from the depths of chaos sprung, when the heavens grew bright with the newborn light, and the stars in chorus sung, to that holy sound, through the space profound, mid their glittering ranks I trod, for I am a part of the central heart, co-equal and one with God. The world is my child, though willful and wild, yet I know that she loves me still, for she thinks I fled with her holy dead because of her stubborn will and she weeps at night when the angels light their watchfires over the sky like a maid o'er the grave of her loved and brave but the truth can never die one by one like sparks from the sun i have counted the souls that came from the hand divine all all are mine and i call them by my name one by one like sparks to the sun i shall see them all return though tempest tossed yet they are not lost and not one shall cease to burn I only speak to the lowly and meek, to the simple and childlike heart. But I leave the proud to their glittering shout and the chicks of their cunning art. Like a white-winged dove from the home of love, through the airy space untrod, I come at the cry which is heard on high, Hear me, O God, my God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doton. Poem 3. The Embarkation. Read for LibriVox.org by Diana Schmidt. So they left that goodly and pleasant city, which had been their resting place near twelve years. But they knew they were pilgrims, and looked not much to those things, but lifted their eyes to heaven, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. 
e winslow the band of pilgrim exiles in tearful silence stood while thus outspake in parting john robinson the good fare thee well my brave miles standish thou hast a trusty sword but not with carnal weapons shalt thou glorify the lord fare thee well good elder brewster thou art a man of prayer commend the flock i give thee to the holy shepherd's care and thou beloved carver what shall i say to thee i have need in this my sorrow that thou shouldst comfort me in the furnace of affliction must all be sharply tried but naught prevails against us if the lord be on our side farewell farewell my people go and stay not the hand but precious seed of freedom sow ye broadcast through the land ye may scatter it in sorrow and water it with tears but rejoice for those who gather the fruit in after years i rejoice that ye may leave them an altar unto god on the holy soil of freedom where no tyrant's foot hath trod all honor to our sovereign his majesty king james but the king of kings above us the highest homage claims upon the deck together they knelt them down and prayed the husband and the father the matron and the maid the broad blue heavens above them bright with the summer's glow and the wide wide waste of waters with its treacherous waves below around the loved and cherished whom they should see no more and the dark uncertain future stretching dimly on before oh well might edward winslow look sadly on his bride oh well might fair rose standish press to her chieftain's side for with crucified affections they bowed the knee in prayer and besought that god would aid them to suffer and to bear to bear the cross of sorrow a broader shield of love than the royal cross of england that proudly waved above the balmy winds of summer swept o'er the glittering seas it brought the sign of parting the white sails met the breeze one farewell gush of sorrow one prayerful blessing more and the bark that bore the exiles glided slowly from the shore thus they left that goodly city or stormy seas to roam but they knew that they were pilgrims and this world was not their home there is a god in heaven whose purpose none may tell there is a god in heaven who doeth all things well and thus an infant nation was cradled on the deep while hosts of holy angels were set to guard its sleep no seer no priest or prophet read its horoscope at birth no bard in solemn saga sung its destiny to earth but slowly 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 as the acorn from the sod it grew in strength and grandeur and spread its arms abroad the eyes of distant nations turned towards that goodly tree and they saw how fair and pleasant were the fruits of liberty like earth's convulsive motion before the earthquake's shock like the foaming of the ocean around old plymouth rock so the deathless love of freedom the majesty of right in all kindred and all nations is rising in its might and words of solemn warning come from the honored dead woe woe to the oppressor if righteous blood be shed rush not blindly on the future heed the lessons of the past for the feeble and the faithful are the conquerors at last end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem four kepler's vision read for LibriVox.org by abigail johnston how grand the spectacle of a mind thus relentless thirsting with unquenchable appetite after beauty and harmony never was there a finer example of a spirit too vast to be satiated with the few who surround it or one that more empathetically foreboded a necessary immortality 
Professor R.P. Nichol. Upon the clear, bright northern sky, Aurora's rainbow arches gleamed, while from their radiant source on high the countless host of evening beamed, each moving in its path of light, those path by science then untrod, the silent guardians of the night, the watchers by the throne of God. Far up above the gloomy wood, the wavy, murmuring wood of pine, upon the mountain side there stood a worshipper in nature's shrine, his spirit, like a breathing lyre, at each celestial touch awoke and burning with a sacred fire his voice the solemn silence broke o glittering host o golden line i would i had an angel's ken your deepest secrets to divine and read your mysteries to men the glorious truth is in my soul the solemn witness in my heart although ye move as one great whole each bears his own appointed part he slept no in a blissful trance the feebler powers of nature lay while upward over the vast expanse his eager spirit swept away away into those fields of light by human footsteps unexplored order and beauty met his sight he saw he wondered and adored and o'er the vast area of space and through the height and depth profound each starless void and shining place was filled with harmony of sound now swelling like the voice of seas with the full rushing tide of years then sighing like an evening breeze it died among the distant spheres rich goblets filled with samian wine or life's elixir sparkling high could not impart such joy divine as that full chorus of the sky he might have heard the orphean lute or caught the sound of memnon's lyre and yet his lips could still be mute nor feel one spark of kindred fire but now o'er ravished soul and sense such floods of living music broke that filled with rapture too intense his disenchanted spirit woke awoke but not to lose the sound the echo of that holy song he breathed it to the world around and others bore the strain along oh unto few the power is given to pass beyond the bounds of time and lift the radiant veil of heaven to view her mysteries sublime yet thou in whose majestic light the source of knowledge lies concealed Prepare us to receive aright the truth that yet shall be revealed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doten. Poem number five, Love and Latin. Read for LibriVox.org by Annie Rue. Love and Latin. Amo, amare, amavi, amatum. Dear girls, never marry for knowledge, though that should, of course, form a part, for often the head in a college gets wise at the cost of a heart. Let me tell you a fact that is real. I once had a bow in my youth, my brightest and best bow ideal of manliness, goodness, and truth. Oh, he talked of the Greeks and the Romans, of Normans and Saxons and Celts, and he quoted from Virgil and Homer and Plato and somebody else and he told me his deathless affection by means of a thousand strange herbs with numberless words in connection derived from the roots of greek verbs one night as a sly innuendo when nature was mantled in snow he wrote in the frost on the window a sweet word in latin amo oh it needed no words for expression for that i had long understood but there was his written confession, present tense and indicative mood. But oh, how a man's passion will vary! For scarcely a year had passed by when he changed the amo to amare, but instead of an e was a y. Yes, amare had certainly taken the heart once so fondly my own, and I, the rejected, forsaken, was left to reflection alone since then i've a horror of latin and students uncommonly smart true love one should always put that in to balance the head by the heart to be a fine scholar and linguist is much to one's credit i know but i love should be said in plain english and not with a latin amo end of poem this recording is in the public domain Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doten. 
Poem six Song of the North Read for LibriVox.org by Diana Schmidt The Fate of Sir John Franklin In March of eighteen fifty four, says the Cleveland Herald, several months before the arrival of Dr. Ray, with his news of probable death of the brave Sir John Franklin and his faithful comrades, we copied from the Lily of the Valley for eighteen fifty four a beautiful poem by miss lizzie doten in reference to these adventurers the verses are touching and solemn as the sound of a passing bell and appear almost prophetic of the news that afterwards came the song of the north again becomes deeply interesting as connected with the thrilling account brought home by the fox the last vessel sent in search of the lost adventurers to the icy north and the last that will now ever be sent on such an expedition buffalo daily republic away away cried the stout sir john while the blossoms are on the trees for the summer is short and the time speeds on as we sail for the northern seas ho gallant crozier and brave fitz james we will startle the world i trow when we find a way through the northern seas that never was found till now a good stout ship is the erebus as ever unfurled a sail and the terror will match with as brave a one as ever outrode a gale so they bade farewell to their pleasant homes to the hills and the valleys green with three hearty cheers for their native isle and three for the english queen they sped them away beyond cape and bay where the day and the night are one where the hissing light in the heavens grew bright and flamed like a midnight sun there was naught below save the fields of snow that stretched to the icy pole as the esquimaux in his strange canoe was the only living soul along the coast like a giant host the glittering icebergs frowned or they met on the main like a battle plain and crashed with a fearful sound the seal and the bear with a curious stare looked down from the frozen heights and the stars in the skies with their great wild eyes peered out from the northern lights the gallant crozier and brave fitz james and even the stout sir john felt a doubt like a chill through their warm hearts thrill as they urged the good ships on they sped them away beyond cape and bay where even the tear-drops freeze but no way was found by a strait or sound to sail through the northern seas they sped them away beyond cape and bay and they sought but they sought in vain for no way was found through the ice around to return to their homes again then the wild waves rose and the waters froze till they closed like a prison wall and the icebergs stood in the sullen flood like their jailers grim and tall o oh god o oh god it was hard to die in that prison house of ice for what was fame or a mighty name when life was the fearful price the gallant crozier and brave fitz james and even the stout sir john had a secret dread and their hopes all fled as the weeks and the months passed on then the ice king came with his eyes of flame and looked on that fated crew his chilling breath was as cold as death and it pierced their warm hearts through a heavy sleep that was dark and deep came over their weary eyes and they dreamed strange dreams of the hills and streams and the blue of their native skies the christmas chimes of the good old times were heard in each dying ear and the dancing feet and the voices sweet of their wives and their children dear but it faded away 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 like a sound on a distant shore and deeper and deeper grew the sleep till they slept to wake no more oh the sailor's wife and the sailor's child 
they will weep and watch and pray and the lady jane she will hope in vain as the long years pass away the gallant crozier and the brave fitz james and the good sir john have found an open way to a quiet bay and a port where we all are bound let the waters roar on the ice-bound shore that circles the frozen pole but there is no sleep and no grave so deep that can hold a human soul end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem seven the burial of webster read for LibriVox.org by abigail johnston low and solemn be the requiem above the nation's dead let fervent prayers be uttered and farewell blessings said close by the sheltering homestead beneath the household tree where oft his footstep lingered here let the parting be draw near in solemn silence with slow and measured tread come with the brow uncovered and gaze upon the dead how like a fallen hero in silent rest he lies with the seal of death upon him and its dimness in his eyes speak but there comes no answer that voice of power is still which woke the slumbering senate as with a giant's will that voice which rang so proudly back from the echoing walls in court civic council and legislative halls which summoned back those spirits who long were mute and still the pilgrim sires of plymouth the dead of bunker hill and in their silent presence gave to the past a tongue like that which roused the nations when freedom's war cry rung but now the roar of cannon the thunder of the deep the battle shock of earthquakes cannot wake him from his sleep the foot that trod so proudly upon the earth's green sod the manly form created in the image of its god the brow where mental greatness had set her noblest seal the lip whence thoughts were uttered like shafts of polished steel all all of these shall moulder back to their parent earth back to the silent bosom from whence they sprang to birth the man the living webster passed with a fleeting breath alas for human greatness the end thereof is death oh what is earthly glory asked caesar when he fell the base of pompey's statue slain by those he loved too well asked the carthaginian hero who kept his fearful vow asked napoleon in his exile asked the dead before ye now and one answer and one only in the light of truth is given man's highest earthly glory is to do the will of heaven to rise and battle bravely with dauntless moral might in the holy cause of freedom and the triumph of the right for by the simple standard shall all at last be tried and not by earthly glory or works of human pride o webster thou wast mighty among thy fellow-men and he who seeks to judge thee must be what thou hast been must feel thine aspirations for higher aims in life and know the stern temptations that urged thee in the strife must let his heart flow largely from out its narrow span and meet thee freely fairly as man should meet with man what was lost and what resisted is known to one alone then let him who stands he guiltless be first to cast a stone farewell we give with mourning back to thy mother earth the robes thy soul rejected at its celestial birth a mightier one and stronger may stand where thou wast tried yet he shall be the wiser that thou hast lived and died thy greatness be his glory thine errors let him shun and let him finish nobly what thou hast left undone farewell the granite mountains the hillside and the sea thy harvest fields and orchards will all lament for thee farewell a mighty nation awards thee deathless fame and future generations shall honor webster's name end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem eight the parting of sigurd and gerda read by kim gibbs he is a strong proud man such as a woman might with pride call her partner if only oh if he would but understand her nature and allow it to be worth something see miss bremer's brothers and sisters the parting of sigurd and gerda she stood beneath the moonlight pale with calm uplifted eye while all her being weak and frail thrilled with her purpose high for she 
the long affianced bride must seal the fount of tears and break with woman's lofty pride the plighted faith of years ay she had loved as in a dream and woke at length to find how coldly on her spirit gleamed the dazzling light of mind for little was the true deep love of that pure spirit known to him the cold the selfish one who claimed her as his own and what to him were all her dreams of purer holier life such idle fancies ill became a meek submissive wife and what were all her yearnings high for god and fatherland but vain chimeras lofty flights while sigurd held her hand and then uprose the bitter thought why bow to his control why sacrifice before his pride the freedom of my soul better to break the golden chain and live and love apart than feel the galling grinding links wearing upon my heart he came and with a soft low voice in the pale gleaming light she laid her gentle hand in his sigurd we part to-night long have these bitter words been kept within this heart of mine and often i have lonely wept i never can be thine proudly with folded arms he stood and cold sarcastic smile ha this is but a wayward mood an artful woman's wile but this i know so long so long i've held thee to thy vow that i have made the bond too strong for thee to break it now you know me not my lofty pride was hidden from your eyes but you have crushed it down so low it gives me strength to rise oh all my bitter burning thoughts i may not dare not tell sigurd my loved for ever loved farewell once more farewell one moment and those loving arms were gently round him thrown one moment and those quivering lips pressed lightly to his own and then he stood alone alone with eyes too proud for tears yet o'er his stern cold heart was thrown the burning blight of years o oh, man so godlike in thy strength preeminent in mind seek not with these high gifts alone a woman's heart to bind for timid as a shrinking fawn yet faithful as a dove she clings through life and death to thee won by thine earnest love end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doten poem nine the meeting of sigurd and gerda read by kim gibbs and beautiful now stood they there man and woman no longer pale eye to eye hand to hand as equals as partners in the light of heaven see miss bremer's brothers and sisters the meeting of sigurd and gerda o oh, early love o oh, early love why does this memory haunt me yet peace i invoke thee from above i cannot though i would forget how i have sought with prayers and tears to quench this wasting passion flame but after long long weary years it burns within my heart the same she wept poor sorrowing gerda wept in the dark pine wood wandering lone while cold the night winds past her swept and bright the stars above her shone poor suffering dove her song was hushed the blithesome song of other days yet oh when such true hearts are crushed they breathe their holiest sweetest lays a step was heard her heart beat high through the dim shadows of the wood she glanced with quick and anxious eye lo sigurd by her stood and as the moon's pale quivering rays stole through that lonely place he stood with calm impassioned gaze fixed on her tearful face gerda he said i come to speak a long a last farewell some distant land and home i seek far far from thee to dwell o oh, since i lost thee gentle one 
my truest and my best i have rushed madly blindly on nor dared to think of rest the night that spreads her starry wing beyond the northern sea does not a deeper darkness bring than that which rests on me yet no i will not ask thy tears for my deep tale of woe forgetfulness will come with years gerda my love i go stay sigurd stay oh why depart see at thy feet i bow o cherished idol of my heart reject reject me now but not upon the cold damp ground her bended knee she pressed upheld and firmly clasped around she wept upon his breast reject thee no when earth rejects the sunshine's summer glow when heaven one suppliant's prayer neglects then i will bid thee go and by the watching stars above and by all things divine i swear to cherish and to love this heart that beats to mine o oh, holy sense of wrongs forgot and injuries forgiven the human heart that feels thee not knows not the peace of heaven ye blessed spirits from above who guide us while we live o oh, teach us also how to love and freely to forgive end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poems from the inner life part two the succeeding poems were given under direct spirit influence before public audiences for many of them i could not obtain the authorship but for such as i could the names are given the spirit child by jenny o thou holy heaven above us o ye angel hosts who love us ye alone know how to prove us by the discipline of life that we faint not in endeavour but with cheerful courage ever rise victorious in the strife o oh, my sister o oh, my brother i was once a mortal mother one sweet blossom and no other bloomed upon the household tree very fragile very tender very beautiful and slender he was dear as life to me all the springtimes fresh unfolding all of art's exquisite moulding all that thrills one in beholding centred in that fair young face with an angel-tempered gladness almost blending into sadness filled him with a nameless grace and i loved him without measure o oh, a ceaseless fount of pleasure found i in that little treasure and my heart grew good and great as i thanked the god in heaven that this precious one was given thus to cheer my low estate but with all my prayers ascending i could hear a low voice blending like some benison descending saying place thy hopes above for the test of all affection is the full and free rejection of all selfishness in love then i felt a sad foreboding all my love to anguish goading all my inward peace corroding and my rebel heart begun crying wildly that i would not yield my precious one i could not say thy will not mine be done springtime came with genial showers bursting buds and opening flowers singing birds and sunny hours filling heaven and earth with light but the summer fair deceiver came with pestilence and fever came my little bud to blight o'er my threshold silence stealing chilling every sense and feeling all the fount of grief unsealing came the great white angel death and my flower upon my bosom withered like an early blossom stricken by the north wind's breath and i saw him weakly lying heard his parched lips faintly sighing knew that he was dying dying and my love was vain to save all my wild impassioned pleading all my fervent interceding could not triumph o'er the grave vainly did i crave permission that my anxious tearful vision might behold the land elysian 
forth into the unknown dark of that broad mysterious river did the hand of god the giver launch that little fragile bark then my brain grew wild to madness changing to a sullen sadness tempered by no ray of gladness and i cursed the god above that with heaven all full of angels sounding forth their glad evangels he should take my little dove then my eyelids knew no sleeping once my midnight watch while keeping i had wept beyond all weeping suddenly there seemed to fall from my spiritual being from my inward sense of seeing scales as from the eyes of paul heavenly gales were round me playing angel hands my soul were staying and i heard a clear voice saying come up hither come and see o oh, thou sorrow-stricken mother unto thee as to none other heaven unfolds her mystery god's own spirit seemed to move me all the heaven grew bright above me all the angels seemed to love me waved their white hands as they smiled and one fair as summer moonlight crowned with starry gems of midnight brought to me my angel child like a flower in sunshine blowing cheeks and lips and eyes were glowing i could see that he was growing fairer than the things on earth thou mayst take him said the spirit back to earth there to inherit all the woes of mortal birth i had no need of advising in divinest strength arising or my selfishness despising nay i cried now first i know what it is to be a mother to give being to another living soul for joy or woe keep him in these heavenly places fold him in your pure embraces teach him the divinest graces i return to earth again not to sit and weep supinely but to live and love divinely and the angel said amen o thou holy heaven above us o ye angel hosts who love us ye alone know how to prove us by the discipline of life that we faint not in endeavour but with cheerful courage ever rise victorious in the strife end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem eleven reconciliation god of the granite and of the rose soul of the sparrow and the bee the mighty tide of being flows through countless channels lord from thee it leaps to life in grass and flowers through every grade of being runs till from creation's radiant towers its glory flames in stars and suns o ye who sit and gaze on life with folded hands and fettered will who only see amid the strife the dark supremacy of ill know that like birds and streams and flowers the life that moves you is divine nor time nor space nor human powers your godlike spirit can confine once in a form of human mould upon this earthly plane i trod my faith was weak my heart was cold i had no hope i knew no god deep from my being's cup i quaffed with life's elixir brimming o'er and madly sought to drain the draught that i might die to live no more there came an angel to my side not from the bowers of paradise she was mine own mine earthly bride with heaven's pure sunshine in her eyes she wept and prayed she knew not why her faith not reason soared above she talked of god and heaven and i well i was happy in her love love was my all my guiding star and like a wanderer in the night i hailed its radiance from afar because it shone with certain light but all those visions bright and high which the pure-hearted only see of god and immortality could not reveal their light to me at length my precious one my wife held her bosom's sacred shrine a tender form an infant life the union of her soul and mine 
O God, above that precious child, first did I breathe thy holy name, while strong emotions, deep and wild, shook like a reed my manly frame. I prayed for heaven's eternal years, I prayed for light that I might see, and even with stern manhood's tears, I prayed for faith, O God, in thee. Oh, this poor world seemed far too small to hold the measure of my love. They were my God, my heaven, my all, my precious wife, my nestling dove. I then there came a fearful day, a day of sorrow and of pain, when like a helpless child I lay and fever burned in every vein. Weeks came and went, they went and came till faith was fear and hope had died, and I could only breathe the name of the lone watcher at my side. With patient love that could not fail, and anxious care that knew no rest, she sat like a Madonna, pale, with our sweet infant on her breast. From them I beat life's stormy wave, and struggled face to face with death. For them I tarried from the grave, and firmly held my mortal breath. But faint and weak at length I lay, while darkness gathered over all. I felt my pulses fluttering play, like autumn leaves about to fall. My poor, tired heart could do no more, but yielded the unequal strife. Ay, then I prayed, as ne'er before, that I might have eternal life. O oh God, my sainted mother's face gleamed through the deepening shades of death and from her lips these words of grace fell gently as the evening's breath child of my love i gave to earth thy mortal form in grief and pain lo now in this thy second birth i lend my strength to thee again that angel presence stood revealed to her who sat beside my bed our quivering lips love's compact sealed and one brief parting word was said then leaning like a weary child my head upon my mother's breast she bore me changed and reconciled to the fair dwellings of the blest but oft at morn or close of day i feel the love that toward me yearns and earthward o'er the starry way my answering spirit gladly turns o death o grave before heaven's light thy gloomy phantoms quickly fly and man shall learn this truth aright that he must change but shall not die shall change as doth the summer rose the evening light the closing year shall sink into a sweet repose to waken in a happier sphere shall fall as falls the harvest grain the ripened ears of golden corn which yields its life that yet again through ceaseless change it be reborn god of the granite and the rose soul of the sparrow and the bee the mighty tide of being flows through all the creatures back to thee thus round and round the circle runs a mighty sea without a shore while men and angels stars and suns unite to praise thee evermore end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by Lizzie Doten. Poem 12. Hope for the Sorrowing. Read for LibriVox.org by Abigail Johnston. A poem delivered at the funeral service of Mr. Henry L. Kingman of North Bridgewater, Massachusetts, November 1862. Ye holy ministers of love, bless dwellers in the upper spheres. In vain we fix our gaze above, for we are blinded by our tears. Oh, tell us to what land unknown the soul of him we love has flown. He left us when his manly heart with earnest hope was beating high. Too soon it seemed for us to part, too soon, alas, for him to die. We have the tenement of clay, but I, the soul, has passed away, away into the unknown dark. With fearless heart and steady hand, he calmly launched his fragile bark to seek the spirit's fatherland. Say, has he reached some distant shore to speak with us on earth no more? We gaze into unmeasured space and lift our tearful eyes above to catch the gleaming of his face or one light whisper of his love o oh god o oh angels hear our cry nor let our faith in darkness die hark for a voice of gentle tone the answer to our cry hath given 
soft as aeolian harp strings blown responsive to the breath of even i have not sought a distant shore lo i am with you weep no more i love is far stronger than death and wins the victory o'er the grave dependent on no mortal breath its mission is to guide and save above the wrecks of death and time it triumphs changeless and sublime still shall my love its vigils keep true as the needle to the pole for death is not a dreamless sleep nor is the grave's man's final goal the larger growth the life divine all that i hoped or wished are mine lest spirit we will weep no more but lay our selfishness to rest the providence which we adore has ordered all things for the best life's battle fought the victory won to nobler toils pass on pass on end of poem this recording is in the public domain Poems from the Inner Life of Lizzie Doten. Poem 13. Compensation. Read for LibriVox.org by Diana Schmidt. Out in the desolate midnight, out in the cold and rain, with the bitter bleak winds of winter driving across the plain, in the ghastly gloom of the churchyard, crouching behind a stone, fleeing from what is called justice, I was safe with the dead alone all of the madness and evil that into my nature was cast all of the demon or devil had filled up its measure at last blood on my hands of a brother blood an indelible stain burning and smarting and eating into my heart and my brain in woe and iniquity shapen conceived by my mother in sin forecast in a soil of pollution did the life of my being begin i chose not the nature within me i was fated and fashioned by birth foreordained to the darkness and evil the sins and the sorrows of earth the world was my foe ere it knew me it scattered its snares in my path like a serpent it charmed and it drew me then met me with judgment and wrath i saw that the strong crushed the weaker that wickedness won in the strife and the greatest of crimes and of curses was the lot of a beggar in life e'en the arm of god's mercy seemed shortened for all that could gladden or save the child of my love and its mother were laid in the pitiless grave then weakened and wasted by hunger i famished without and within all homeless and hopeless and friendless oh what was there left me but sin i met in the woodpath a lordling arrayed in his garments of pride and like moses who slew the egyptian i smote him so sore that he died oh the blood on my hands and my garments oh the terrible face of the dead his gold could not tempt me to linger i turned in my horror and fled i fled but a terrible phantom pursued like a demon of wrath in the forest the field or the churchyard its footsteps were close on my path and there on the grave of my loved ones as freezing and famished i lay i was seized by the human avenger and borne to the judgment away oh the prison the sentence the gallows that last fearful struggle for breath the rush and the roar and confusion the depth and the darkness of death o oh man i have sinned and have suffered the climax of evil is past but the justice of time may determine that you were more guilty at last then long did i struggle with phantoms and wandered in darkness and night till there came to my soul in its prison the form of an angel of light i thought in my blindness and darkness that he was the infinite god who had come in the might of his vengeance to smite with his merciless rod so i cursed him and cursed him and cursed him that he in his greatness and power had summoned my soul into being and made me to suffer one hour i cursed him for all of my sorrow for all of my weakness and sin for all of my hatred and evil for darkness without and within 
my words were all molten and glowing as if from a furnace they came and the breath of my wrath made them hotter till they burned with the fierceness of flame then a light that was in me grew brighter like sunshine poured into the heart i felt all my burdens grow lighter and the dross from my nature depart my brother replied the bright angel let the name of the highest be blessed lo he renders the blessing for cursing his will and his way are the best thy soul in his sight hath been precious since the birth of thy being began thou art judged by the need of thy nature and not by the standard of man then out of my cursing and madness and out of the furnace of flame my soul like a jewel of beauty annealed through life's processes came the forms of my loved ones were near me the night of my sorrow had passed god grant you o mortals who judged me as full an acceptance at last end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem fourteen the eagle of freedom read for LibriVox.org by abigail johnston o land of our glory our boast and our pride where the brave and the fearless for freedom have died how clear is the lustre that beams from thy name how bright on thy brow are the laurels of fame the stars of thy union still burn in the sky and the scream of thine eagle is heard from on high his eyrie is built where no foe can invade nor traitors prevail with the brand and the blade the eagle of freedom in danger and night keeps watch o'er our flag from his star-circled height from mountain and valley from hilltop and sea three cheers for the eagle the bird of the free hurrah 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 for the eagle the bird of the free mount up o thou eagle and rend in thy flight the war-cloud that hides our broad banner from sight guard guard it from danger though war rent and worn and see that no star from its azure is torn keep thy breast the storm and thine eye on the sun till true to our motto the many are one till the red rage of war with its tumult shall cease and the dove shall return with the olive of peace the eagle of freedom in danger and night keeps watch o'er our flag from the star-lighted height from mountain and valley from hillside and sea three cheers for the eagle the bird of the free hurrah 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 for the eagle the bird of the free o oh, sons of the mighty the true and the brave the souls of your heroes rest not in the grave the holy libation to liberty poured has streamed not in vain from the blood crimson sword henceforth with your star-spangled banner unfurled your might shall be felt to the ends of the world and rising republics like nebulae gleam wherever the stars of your nation shall beam the eagle of freedom sublime in his flight shall rest on your banner encircled with light and then shall the chorus and unison be three cheers for the eagle the bird of the free hurrah 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 for the eagle the bird of the free end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem fifteen mistress glenare by marion read for librivox dot org by abigail johnston a virtuous woman is mistress glenare or at least so the world in his judgment would say with an orderly walk and a circumspect air she never departs from the popular way every word that she speaks is well measured and weighed her friends are selected with scrupulous care and in all that she does is her prudence displayed for a virtuous woman is mistress glenare her youth has departed and with it has fled the impulse which gives to the blood a new start which oftentimes turns from the reasoning head to trust the wisdom of god in the heart thus the robes of her purity never are stained and her feet are withheld from the pitfall and snare where nothing is ventured there nothing is gained oh a virtuous woman is mistress glenare she makes no distinction of sinners from sin her words are like arrows her tongue is a rod she sees no excuse for the evil within but condemns with the zeal of a partialist god on a background of darkness of sorrow and shame her own reputation looks stainless and fair so she builds up her fame through her neighbor's bad name oh a virtuous woman is mistress glenare she peeps and she listens she watches and waits 
nor satan himself is more active than she to expose in poor sinners the faults and bad traits which she fears that the lord might not happen to see when the father of spirits looks down from above on the good and the evil the frail and the fair how he must regard with particular love the virtuous woman good mistress glenair oh mistress glenair in the drama of life you are acting a very respectable part you have known just enough of its envious strife to deceive both the world and your own foolish heart but say in some moment of clear common sense did you never in truth and sincerity dare to ask the plain question aside from pretence how you look to the angels dear mistress glenair the glory of god has enlightened their eyes no longer through darkness they see but in part and the robes of your righteousness do not suffice to cover the lack of true love in the heart you look shabby and filthy and ragged and mean even with those you condemn you but poorly compare go wash you in charity till you are clean you will change for the better dear mistress glenair your thoughts have been run in the popular mould like wax that is plastic and easily built till now like a nondescript lo and behold you are neither yourself nor yet any one else of tender compassion forgiveness and love your nature has not a respectable share you are three parts of serpent and one of the dove very badly proportioned dear mistress glenair your noblest and purest affections have died like summer dried roses your spirit within your heart has grown arid and scarce is supplied with sufficient vitality even to sin but would you be true to your virtuous name there is one we commend to your tenderest care to deal with her wisely will add to your fame that poor sinful woman is mistress glenair end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem sixteen little johnny Read for LibriVox.org by Abigail Johnston. A poem delivered by Miss Lizzie Doton at the close of a lecture in Springfield, May 10th, and addressed to the parents of Little Johnny, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas A. Dennison, Jacob P., Massachusetts. Sing not, O blessed angels, to those who truly mourn, but come with gifts of healing for heart-strings freshly torn. Ah, human hearts are tender and wounds of love are deep. Sing not, O blessed angels, but weep with those who weep come not o spirit teachers with wisdom from above but come with soft low whispers of sympathy and love truth seem uncertain shadows beneath the clouds of care come then in friendly silence and strengthen them to bear what will you bring o angels to soothe the troubled breast we will bring the cherished loved one from the mansions of the blest like a wandering dove returning he shall nestle in each heart they will feel his blessed presence and their sorrow shall depart he will lead them from their darkness out to the shining light and scenes of heavenly beauty shall grant their longing sight there they shall see their loved one free from his earthly pain their souls shall cease from sorrow and shall ask him not again oh we only open gently his little prison door he step into the sunshine and then return no more he dwells not now in weakness in the spirit's narrow cell but yet remains forever to those who loved him well what will ye bring o oh teachers to those who suffer loss we will bring them faith and patience and strength to bear their cross to bear it bravely calmly although the way seem long till hearts that blood with anguish shall burst into a song they shall walk in face clear sunshine with souls renewed in youth and the little child shall lead them to a knowledge of the truth to tell them the loving angels watch o'er their darling boy they are sharers of their sorrow and helpers of their joy End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doton Poem 17 Birdie's Spirit Song Read for LibriVox.org by Abigail Johnston At the conclusion of a lecture in Boston, the following poem was addressed to the chairman, Mr. L. B. Wilson. It was purported to come from Anna Cora, Mr. Wilson's only child, who passed through the spirit world at the age of twelve years and seven months. She was always called by the pet name Bertie. With rosebuds in my hand, fresh from the summer land, Father, I come and stand close by your side. You cannot see me here or feel my presence near, and yet your Bertie dear never has died. Oh, no, for angels bright, out of the blessed light, shone on my wondering sight, singing we come lamb for the fold above tender young nestling dove safe in our arms of love haste to thy home mother i could not stay in a sweet dream i lay wafted to heaven away far from the night and with a glad surprise did i unclose my eyes under those cloudless skies smiling with light 
oh were you with me there free from your earthly care all of my joy to share i were more blessed but it is best to say here in the earthly way till the good angels say come to your rest check then the falling tear think of me still as near father and mother dear soon on that shore where all the loved ones meet resting your pilgrim feet shall you with blessings greet birdie once more end of poem this recording is in the public domain Poems from the Inner Life by Lizzie Doten Poem 18 My Spirit Home Read for LibriVox.org by Abigail Johnston We find the following beautiful stanzas in the Evening Courier, published in Portland, Maine. They were composed in Spirit Life by Miss A. W. Sprague, and spoken under her spirit influence by Liz Lizzie Doten, at the close of her lecture in that city on Sunday evening, March 22nd. The lines are evidently from the spirit of Miss Sprague, who passed to the spirit world last summer from her home in Vermont, as there are allusions in it to the incidents which took place during her illness in Oswego, New York, about a year since. Allusion is also made to a poem written by her and published in the banner, and also another poem of hers, I Wait, I Wait at the Golden Gate, Banner of Light. I come, I come from my spirit home, like a bird in the early spring to the loved ones here whom my heart holds dear a message of love to bring oh the heavens are wide but they cannot divide the spirits whom love makes free the green old earth and the land of my birth with its homes are still dear to me the phantoms of pain in my burning brain have fled from the heavens clear light i lie no more on the lake's lone shore in the fever dreams of night oh it was not late when i fled from fate and that which the world calls sin no longer I wait at the golden gate, for the angels have let me in. Oh, not too soon, though at life's high noon was the close of my earthly day. As the roses fade, ere the evening shade, I passed from the earth away. And I knew not the blight of the bitter night, which withers the autumn flowers, or the lengthening years with their weight of fears that burden the spirit's powers. In the forest wide, by the lake's green side, the angels had whispered low, from over the sea they had called to me, and I knew that I soon must go. But I felt no fear when I knew they were near, nor shrank from the narrow way, for I caught faint gleams of the crystal streams in the light of the heavenly day. Oh, the angels bright with their robes of light, the clasp of each gentle hand, and the eyes that smiled on earth's weary child as I entered the better land. But words are weak when the soul would speak of the angel home above. Faint visions alone to man made known of that dwelling of light and love. My home is there in that world so fair, but the space is not deep or wide which lies between this earthly scene and the home on the other side. The thought of love, like a carrier dove, shall the heart's fond message bear, as the angel bands with their willing hands shall answer each earnest prayer. Fare ye well, farewell, my spirit can dwell in the earthly form no more, but whither I go, and the way ye shall know to your home on the other shore soon over the sea he shall walk with me on the hills by the angels trod in garments white with the sons of light and the freedom and peace of god end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doten poem 19 i still live read for LibriVox.org by diana schmidt given under the inspiration of miss a w sprague at the conclusion of a lecture in philadelphia october twenty fifth eighteen sixty three o thou whose love is changeless both now and evermore source of all conscious being thy goodness i adore lord i would ever praise thee for all thy love can give but most of all o father i thank thee that i live I live, O ye who loved me, your faith was not in vain. Back through the shadowy valley I come to you again. Safe in the love that guides me, with fearless feet I tread. My home is with the angels, O oh, say not I am dead. Not dead, O oh, no, but lifted above all earthly strife. Now first I know the meaning, and feel the power of life the power to rise uncumbered by woe or want or care 
to breathe fresh inspiration from pure celestial air to feel that all the tempests of human life have passed and that my ark in safety rests on the mount at last to send my soul's great longings like noah's dove abroad and find them swift returning with signs of peace from god to soar in fearless freedom through broad blue boundless skies and catch the radiant gleaming of lovelit angel eyes to feel the father's presence around me near or far and see his radiant glory stretch onward star by star to feel those grand upliftings that know not space nor time to hear all discords ending in harmony sublime to know that sin and error are dimly understood and that which man calls evil is undeveloped good to stand in spellbound rapture on some celestial height and see god's glorious sunshine dispel the shades of night to feel that all creation with love and joy is rife this o oh my earthly loved ones this is eternal life there eyes that closed in darkness shall open to the morn and those whom death had stricken shall find themselves new-born the lame shall leap with gladness the blind rejoice to see the slave shall know no master and the prisoner shall be free there the worn and heavy laden their burdens shall lay down there crosses born in meekness at length shall win the crown and lonely hearts that famished for sympathy and love shall find a free affection in the angel home above o children of our father weep not for those who pass like rose leaves gently scattered like dewdrops from the grass ay look not down in sadness but fix your gaze on high they only dropped their mantles their souls can never die they live and still unbroken is that magnetic chain which in your tearful blindness you thought was rent in twain that chain of love was fashioned by more than human art and every link is welded so firm it cannot part they live but oh not idly to fold their hands to rest for they who love god truly are they who serve him best love lightens all their labor and makes all duty sweet their hands are never weary nor wayworn are their feet thus by that world of beauty and by that light of love and by the holy angels who listen now above i pledge my soul's endeavor to do whate'er i can to bless my sister woman and aid my brother man o thou whose love is changeless both now and evermore source of all conscious being thy goodness i adore lord i would ever praise thee for all thy love can give but most of all o father i thank thee that i live end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doten number twenty life read by k hand to be or not to be is not the question there is no choice of life i mark it well for death is but another name for change the weary shuffle off their mortal coil and think to slumber in eternal night but lo the man though dead is living still unclothed is clothed upon and his mortality is swallowed up of life he babbles o'er the green fields then falls asleep and straight awakes amid eternal verdure fairer than dreams of a midsummer's night the fields elysian stretch before him no tempest rends the ever peaceful bowers of asphodel and fadeless amaranth no hot sirocco blows with poisonous breath no midnight frights him with its goblins grim presaging sudden death no macbeth there mad with ambition plotteth damning deeds no hamlet 
haunted by his father's ghost stalks wildly forth intent on vengeance dire the curse of cain on earth is consummate and knows no resurrection spirits learn that spirit is immortal and no poisoned cup or dagger's thrust or sting of deadly asp can rob it of its godlike attribute this mortal garb may be as full of wounds and bloody rents as royal caesar's mantle yet that which made it man or caesar liveth still man learns in this valhalla of his soul to love nor ever finds love's labor lost no two-faced falstaff proffers double suit no desdemona mourns iago's art and every romeo finds his juliet the stroke of death is but a kindly frost which cracks the shell and leaves the kernel room to germinate what most consummate fools this fear of death doth make us reason plays the craven unto sense and in her fear chooses the slow and slavish death of life rather than freedom in the life of death thus ignorance makes cowards of us all and blinds us to our being's best estate madly we cling to life through nameless ills pinched by necessity and scourged by fate fainting in heat and freezing in the cold while war and pestilence and sore distress fever and famine fire and flood combine to drive the spirit from its wreck of clay o poor humanity how full of blots and stains and pains and miseries thou art here let me be thine antony and plead thy cause against the slayers of thy peace though wounded yet thou art not dead thou child of immortality thou heir of god he who would slay thee be he brute or brutus plunges the dagger in his own vile heart and yet thy wounds are piteous i could weep that aught so fair from the creator's hand should be so marred and mangled like a lamb torn by the ravening wolves here let me take thy mantle pierced with gaping ghastly wounds from daggers clutched by ingrate hands o truth how many in thy sacred name have slain humanity thinking they did god service rome and not caesar doctrines and not men i cannot count the wounds which lust for power and wealth and place and precedence have made but oh the keenest deepest deadliest stabs of all were made by false philosophy and false theology combined philosophy that knew not what it did theology that did not what it knew see here this rent made by the fear of god that gracious god whose mercy seasons justice who feeds the raven clothes the lilies heeds the sparrow when it falls and sends his rain alike upon the evil and the good and yet they were all honorable men who taught this doctrine honorable men whose failing was a lack of common sense and lo here is another fear of truth blind superstition made this horrid rent and bigotry quick followed up the thrust oh tis an eye weeping great tears of blood an eagle eye that dared to love the light which bigotry and superstition feared lest it should make their deeds of evil plain thus is it he who dares to see a truth not recognized in creeds must die the death but noonday never stayed for bats and owls and truth's clear light shall yet arise and shine see here another wound the fear of death that blessed consummation of this life which soothes all pain makes good all loss revives the weak gives rest and peace makes free the slave levels all past distinctions and doth place the beggar on a footing with the king o poor humanity those who conspired to slay thee through exceeding love for god and for the glory of his mighty name smote at the very centre of thy peace and damning doubts like daggers thrusts attest how zealously they aimed each cruel blow and yet this rent and bloody mantle is not thee slain but not dead thy spirit shall arise and face thy startled enemies again as royal caesar's ghost appeared to brutus in sardis and philippi's tented plains thou royal heir to kingdoms yet unknown a mightier than caesar is thy friend he stays the hand of cassius brutus all who aim their weapons at thy life and dulls their daggers points against thy deathless soul from every gaping wound of fear or doubt 
murder or malice sorrow or despair thy spirit leaps as from a prison door it laughs at death and daggers as it flies to hold companionship with spirits blessed and having thus informed itself of life the question then to be or not to be is swallowed up in immortality end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem twenty one love o world somewhat i have to say to thee o sin sick heart sick soul sick love sick world so ailing art thou both in part and particle that solid truth thy stomach ill digests yet since thou art my mother i will love thee and heedless of thy frowns will speak right on that which belongs to all men is least prized the thing most common is least understood that which is deep and silent is divine and there is not on earth so craved so common so misunderstood or so divine as love when meted in proportion to man's need measure for measure it doth purify exalt and make him equal with the gods he feeds upon ambrosia and its drink is nectar high olympus cannot yield delights more grateful to his soul and sense parnassus fails his rapture to express and helicon hath less of inspiration but prithee should he chance to drink too deep of the exhilarating draught should plunge him head and ears into this wildering flood mark then what marvellous diversions from the centre of his gravity ensue judgment is scouted sober common sense yields to imagination's airy flights upon a swift-winged hippogriff he mounts to seek the far arcadia of his dreams he builds him castles basks in moonshine feeds among the lilies pours his passion forth in armorous canticles of burning sighs makes him a bed of roses and lies down to revel in his rainbow-colored dreams until some turn some ill-begotten chance most unexpectedly invades his peace and castles moonshine roses rainbows fly and leave him to the stern realities of life alas poor human nature even fools must learn through sad experience to grow wise love is the highest attribute of deity and he who loves divinely is most blessed it purgeth passion from the soul and sense and makes the man a unit in himself head eyes hands heart all work in unison and beasts and savages and rudest hinds all feel alike its exercise of power ambition cannot walk with it for he who learns to live and love all right loves all and finds preferment in the general wheel though proteus like it takes a thousand forms it doth o'ercome and evil with its good casteth out devils sensuality and sin and green-eyed jealousy and hate and like christendom golden mouth it doth attune the words of common speech to sweet accord and give significance to simplest things it buddeth out in tender infancy like fresh-blown violence in the early spring and giveth form and fashion to all life for by its character it doth decide what elements and essences the soul shall draw from contact with material things as roses draw their blushes lilies whiteness violets their azure from the same dull earth so love extracts the sweetness of life and doth so mingle within her crucible that she creates the difference between immortal souls the fiery heart of youth full of high aims and generous purposes of good swells like the ocean waves beneath the moon and brooketh no restraint until it finds its living counterpart and mergeth all it hath of truth and manliness and might into a second and dearer self so goes the world and strong necessity creates the law of action whose results join issue with the love of god himself o jealous wanton ill-conceited world 
how little dost thou understand the deep significance and potency of love thou hast defiled thyself with gross perversions till purity of love is but a jest or reckoned with the fantasies of fools oh i would take thee dear humanity and set thee face to face with perfect love she is thy mother love and wisdom met united by eternal power the world sprang forth from chaos and the love which brought them into being doth sustain them still the monad and the angel rest alike within its all-embracing arms and life and death with all that makes our mortal state are cradled at the footstool of this power then sweet humanity thou favored child of god look up an everlasting chain doth bind thee to the mighty heart of all love's labor never can be lost he who created shall through love perfect and save and that which hath such poor expression here shall find fruition in a brighter sphere end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton number 22 for a vat read for LibriVox.org by k hand the following poem was given under the inspiration of robert burns is there a luckless white on earth oppressed with care and a that who holds his life as little worth his home is heaven for a that for a that and a that there's muckle joy for a that he's seen the worst o hell below his home is heaven for a that the weary slave that drags his chain in toil and grief and a that shall find relief from all his pain and rest in heaven from a that from a that and from a that there's freedom there from a that for justice throws into the scale a recompense for a that pure souls in right not unco strong through love and want and a that there sure is power to right their wrong and save their souls for a that for a that and a that the lord is good for a that the devil himself can turn and mend and come to heaven for a that on scotius hills the gowans spring the heathers bloom and a that the mavis and the merrily sing but heaven's my home for a that for a that and a that i wadna change for a that he who once finds the heaven a boon will not come back for a that end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem 23 words a cheer read for librivox.org by k hand given under the inspiration of robert burns good friends although not present to your sight i gie you greeting here tonight not claiming to be perfect quite frae taint a passion yet will i hold my speech aright in good scotch fashion o oh, could some canty word o mine but make your careworn faces shine or cause the hearts in grief that pine to throb with pleasure then wad my cup to auld lang syne fill to its measure the gracious powers above us know how sair a weight of want and woe must be the lot of those who go through earth to heaven but i the life a boon will show wherefore twas given and that good god who loves us all who sees the chittering sparrow fall will never turn his face awa though you should stray but all his wandering sheep will call back to the way so muckle are the cares of men that truth at times is hard to ken and error to her gruesome den so dark and eerie whiles those who have nay heart to men pure wanderers weary alack how money a luckless wight has gained angly in error's night not that he had less love for right than countless ithers but that he lacked the keener sight of his good brithers lo calvin knox and luther cry i have the truth and i and i 
her sinners if ye gang a glee the dell will hay ye and then the lord will stand aby and will nay save ye but hooly hooly nay so fast when gabriel shall blaw his blast and heaven and earth awa have passed these lang syne saints shall find baith dale and hell at last mere pious faints the upright honest-hearted man who strives to do the best he can need never fear the church's ban or hell's damnation for god will need a special plan for his salvation the one who knows our deepest needs recks little how man counts his beads for righteousness is not in creeds or solemn faces but rather lies in kindly deeds and christian graces then never fear with purpose leal a head to think a heart to feel for human woe and human weal nay preach in loun your sacred birthright e'er can steal to heaven a boon take tent to truth and heed this well the man who sins makes his ain hell there's na worse dell than himsel but god is strongest and when per human hearts rebel he holds out longest with loving kindness he will wait till all the prodigals of fate return unto their fair estate and blessings moany nor will he shut the gowden gate of heaven on oni end of poem this recording is in the public domain poems from the inner life by lizzie doton poem twenty four resurrexi read for librivox dot org by abigail johnston a remarkable poem the following striking poem was recited by miss lizzie doton a spiritual trance speaker at the close of a recent lecture in boston she professed to give it impromptu as far as she was concerned and to speak under the direct influence of edgar allan poe whatever may be the truth about its production the poem is in several respects a remarkable one miss doton is apparently incapable of originating such a poem if it was written for her by someone else and merely committed to memory and recited by her the poem is nevertheless wonderful as a reproduction of the singular music and alliteration of poe's style and is manifesting the same intensity of feeling whoever wrote the poem must have been exceedingly familiar with poe and deeply in sympathy with his spirit but if Miss Doughton is honest, and the poem originated as she said it did, it is unquestionably the most astonishing thing that spiritualism has produced. It does not follow, necessarily, in that case, that Poe himself made the poem, although we are asked to believe a great many spiritual things on less cogent evidence, but it is, in any view of it that may be taken, a very singular and mysterious production. There is, in the second verse, an allusion to a previous poem that purported to come from the spirit of Poe, which was published several years since and attracted much attention but the following poem is of a higher order and much more like poe than the other springfield republican from the throne of life eternal from the home of love supernal where the angel feet make music all over the starry floor mortals i have come to meet you come with the words of peace to greet you and to tell you of the glory that is mine for evermore once before i found a mortal waiting at the heavenly portal waiting but to catch some echo from that ever-opening door then i seized his quickened being and through all his inward seeing caused my burning inspiration in a fiery flood to pour now i come more meekly human and the reek lips of a woman touched with fire from off the altar not with burnings as of yore but in holy love descending with her chastened being blending i would fill your souls with music from the bright celestial shore as one heart yearns for another as a child turns to its mother from the golden gates of glory turn i to the earth once more where i drained the cup of sadness where my soul was stung to madness and life's bitter burning billows swept my burden being o'er here the harpies and the ravens human vampires sordid cravens preyed upon my soul and substance till i writhed in anguish sore life and i then seemed mismated for i felt accursed and faded like a restless wrathful spirit wandering on the stygian shore tortured by a nameless yearning like a frost fire freezing burning did the purple pulsing life tide through its fevered channels pour till the golden bowl life's token into shining shards was broken and my chained and chafing spirit leaped from out its prison door 
but while living striving dying never did my soul cease crying ye who guide the fates and furies give me oh give me i implore from the myriad hosts of nations from the countless constellations one pure spirit that can love me one that i too can adore throw this fervent aspiration from my fainting soul salvation for from out its blackened fire crips did my quickened spirit soar and my beautiful ideal not too saintly to be real burst more brightly on my vision than the loved and lost lenore mid the surging seas she found me with the billows breaking round me and my sad and sinking spirit in her arms of love upbore like a lone one weak and weary wandering in the midnight dreary on her sinless saintly bosom brought me to the heavenly shore like the breath of blossoms blending like the prayers of spirits ascending like the rainbow's seven-hued glory blend our souls for evermore earthly love and lust enslaved me but divinest love hath saved me and i know now first and only how to love and to adore o oh, my mortal friends and brothers we are each and all another's and the soul that gives most freely from its treasure hath the more would you lose your life you find it and in giving love you bind it like an amulet of safety to your heart for evermore end of poem this recording is in the public domain